Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. It's been quite a week in the national park system. Staff at Voyagers National Park in Minnesota reported that a tornado, the first ever recorded in the park's 44-year history, touched down in mid-July and downed hundreds of acres of trees. At Death Valley National Park in California, a Navy pilot was killed when his fighter jet crashed into the wall of Rainbow Canyon near the Father Crowley Overlook. And a New Jersey man, missing for four nights in Great Smoky Mountains National Park in North Carolina, was found in good condition. You can find these and other stories about the parks at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, we have a roundtable discussion of park issues with Kristen Brengel, Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Parks Conservation Association, and Phil Francis, Chair of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. I wrap up the show with some thoughts on Dutch oven cooking in the parks. It's the middle of summer and there's lots to talk about in the national park system and with the National Park Service. E-bikes on trails is an issue. Um, The ongoing budget problems that the Park Service is grappling with There's still no permanent director of the National Park Service. Reorganization seems to be moving forward, at least from the Interior Department uh, view. To discuss those uh, topics and more, we've invited Kristen Brengel, uh, Vice President from the National Parks Conservation Association, and Phil Francis, the uh, chair of the uh, Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. Uh, Welcome, folks. Thank you. Thanks. So I really don't know where to start. Um, Two weeks ago, I had the privilege of going to Acadia National Park um, to speak as part of a a workshop on communications at the Scudic Peninsula, and it was ideal. I couldn't have planned a better midsummer break, but of course, Acadia seems to be ground zero for the movement to allow e-bikes onto trails in the national parks. Um, Curious about what you guys have heard about that, what you think about that, and what do you think uh, the Park Service should do? Well, we heard uh, and we've been hearing this for years now that the Park Service intends to provide some guidance on e-bikes and we'll be interested to see exactly where they go with this. Um, Some people, especially people who use e-bikes, know that they're classified in three different ways. Um, Some only uh, have pedal assist um, and some only engage while you're pedaling. And so it'll it'll be interesting because, as you know, probably from seeing a lot of e-bikes, that they come in all shapes and sizes. And so some are look like road bikes with a battery pack on them, and others are humongous and basically look more like motorcycles and have huge tires and throttles. And so this is sort of the one of the interesting, you know, visitor use management issues of our time right now, where even here in D.C. on the mall, you have scooters and e-bikes and and all sorts of segways. And where do you allow these motorized um, operating uses versus where you have pedestrians and kids and strollers and so on and so forth? And we have to figure this out. You know, the Park Service has to figure this out uh, because there will be, and I see them every day, visitor use conflicts. Yeah, I think that's right, uh, Kristen. We've already sent a letter to the director, the acting director, excuse me, expressing our concern. And under current National Park Service regulations, we feel that e-bikes clearly meet the definition of a motor vehicle and have to be managed uh, in that way. We don't see an appropriate way for the Park Service to manage e-bikes the same as a human-powered bicycle, a short of rulemaking, uh, which means that you would have to amend the definition uh, in a code of federal regulations. Well, I was going to say, too, that uh, you know, I think that there's going to be a lot of pushback um, or, or push for the use of these vehicles as a mobility device. In fact, one of our retired employees has already written us and said, 
Hey, I think we're, you're taking the wrong position on e-bikes because uh, he's a retiree. He can't get around as well as he once could. He thinks this is a way to enjoy and, and visit the park. So I think Kristen is exactly right. The park Service is going to have to decide uh, what they want to do. I can see places where it might work, other places where it definitely wouldn't work well. And I think they have to determine whether or not it's an appropriate use uh, in our national parks. And not every use uh, is appropriate in national parks. And there's a lot of considerations, you know, the capacity to manage, impacts to resources, conflicts with other visitor uses, traditional uses. So there's a lot of questions to be asked and answered, uh, and the public should be involved in this. Tough question. Like many over the years, I mean, it's not unlike in a way, uh, uh, as you were climbing El Capitan and years ago, you, you know, if you didn't use an existing route, you would have to, uh, you know, create a route, and, and that was a hard manual process to do. But with the advent of battery-powered drills and so forth, it became much easier to do. And so as new technology continues to occur in our national parks, the Park Service is going to have to adapt. But I think that uh, a big consideration is the ability to manage and with reduced budgets, reduced number of staff, uh, it's going to make it very difficult for the Park Service to do an adequate job to manage uh, these new uses. You know, on the traveler, the the question of e-bikes in the parks has been one of the most contentious issues in, in recent memory. Um, the number of comments, uh, pro and con, a lot of people are mentioning that, you know, without the e-bike, I wouldn't be able to go out and enjoy the national parks, um, which may or may not be a valid concern. At um, Acadia National Park, you've got the carriage paths, carriage roads, and they already allow bikes on those. So what's the issue? Well, I was out there not long ago myself, uh, Kurt, as you know, several weeks ago. And, it's in, and I think the carriage roads at Acadia are similar in some respects as any other mountain-type park. It's pretty dangerous uh, with high levels of, of motor traffic, not counting the e-bikes, but automobiles and motorcycles and so forth, buses, curvy roads with uh, line of sight challenges and issues, parking issues. Uh, it's going to be a safety problem, and I think the Park Service is going to have to consider that in its decision. Uh, So while, yes, I think it would provide a lot of opportunity for people, more people to see the parks, we've got to make sure that it can be done in a safe manner. But if they already allow bikes on the carriage roads, what's what's the difference in allowing an e-bike? Well, but you know, I think... think, Go ahead, Kristen. I was going to say, you know, in, in looking into this issue... There, there's a difference between e-bikes. Some engage the motor while you're pedaling and only go up to 20 miles per hour, and some have a throttle on them that can get you up to 28 miles per hour. And so there's a difference between the bikes as well that you have to consider in this equation. And, and when some, something increases in speed, it can harm a pedestrian much more than something that's going much slower. And so there are a host of factors like this that the Park Service needs to consider, especially I'm, I'm a mom of young children, moms with strollers using the same trails. You have to, in, in parks that, where you have that kind of use, you have to think about all of those visitors. And I know at NPCA, as we're thinking about this issue, we're trying to think about the urban parks and the parks that have... Um, you know, a large backcountry trail system and what the differences are between those two and how some of the urban parks want the visitor use and people can easily use them on the roads. But I think Phil is pointing out a really good issue, which is at Acadia, you have line of sight issues on the roads where you can't even see the car in front of you because you're, it's already around the bend. And so, you know, the, the park superintendent there has to really think about you know, the safety of everyone in these. But there are some urban parks where, you know, you, you would ride them on the roads and everything would be fine and everything's copacetic. But, um, you know, then there's backcountry use where people who have an e-bike that has a battery that can go for days and days, what does that mean about 
um, enjoying primitive recreation and wilderness designation and proposed wilderness. And there are a host of factors that we have to think about. And um, what is it going to do to the trails? Are they sharing trails with horses? A whole number of issues and factors that you need. This isn't a light decision, I think, is, is what we're both trying to say. And it may be that each park would have to do a regulation in order to allow it and identify specific routes especially backcountry routes where they would be allowed. Is backcountry part of the equation, Kristen? Yeah, it is. And and we actually had one of our interns call um, different uh, parks or different bike shops outside of national parks to just get a sense of uh, places that are actively renting them. And, and you go, you call any bike shop in Moab, Utah, and they are renting e-bikes for a hundred bucks a day. And, so people are definitely using them on the BLM lands and the state lands and, and so on down there. And they're going into the backcountry on them. And that that kind of mixed use on those trails, it, I think it depends on the trail, but it could really change the dynamic out there for a lot of folks. And so I think backcountry is a, a serious you know issue with, with the e-bikes and something that definitely needs to be considered. And as you probably know, Kurt, there are a lot of um, parks that have recommended and potential wilderness, and those places should continue to be managed that way. And mechanized use is not allowed. But if someone can get back there with an e-bike, um, they might try to do that, not knowing the rules. And so that's why it's important for the park service to, if, if they want to allow them, to really engage in a in a process with the public on them. So we're just really clear about where motors are going to be and where the non-motorized use is going to be. You know, as you mentioned, it is a growing trend. I mean, I live in Park City, Utah, and uh, a year ago, you would rarely see any any cyclists out there, and they were all muscle-powered cycles. And the, the number of e-bikes that I see um, going around Park City and even out to uh, uh, Kimmel Junction, which is uh, five or more miles north of uh, the heart of Park City, is amazing. And so you have to wonder... As Zeeps become more and more popular, more and more gateway communities, like you said, Kristen, you're going to see more and more rentals and more and more people are going to be heading out into the, the parks or wanting to head out onto e-bikes into the parks. And, you know, does it create a slippery slope in terms of, you know, segways and, and other motorized scooters? Um, it's definitely something that we need to watch. We could talk for hours on this, I'm sure, but let's let's move along. I mean, one of the interesting things is that we're we're more than two years into the Trump administration. And there still is not a confirmed director of the National Park Service, somebody who could weigh in and perhaps provide some guidance in, in situations like the e-bikes. Um, do you hear anything on uh, David Vela? Is he just uh, lost in uh, limbo? So we've heard that the White House has not um, given the Senate the paperwork for him. I think I've said this before on the show, too. We're in the same position we were the last time I was talking with you guys. Um, so the only difference uh, that has occurred since we last talked is that uh, Rob Wallace is now the Assistant Secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And so this position hasn't been filled for many, many years. And so now that we have an Assistant Secretary who the Director of Fish and Wildlife Service and the Park Service reports to, um, this is a, a, a wonderful development. And he just started... Um, I believe last week, and having someone with some authority who's a presidential appointee is good to see, and hopefully that's a sign that they'll move Vela's appointment forward. I, I agree. That's I've heard the same thing. I've heard that uh, you know, some nominations have moved forward, but not David's. But you know that's hearsay at this point. Um, we we normally check the website to see which nominations have been forward. And I haven't heard yet from our guy who checks that whether or not it's on the list. I assume it's not. But I sure hope it gets done uh, quickly. And we've got way too many actings already in the National Park Service. It's not just a director's position, but there's acting spread all throughout the parks. Hold that thought, Phil. We're going to take a short break, and we'll come back, and that's one of the topics I want to um, get into. We're talking today with uh, Christian Brengel, the Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Parks Conservation Association, and Phil Francis, uh, Chair of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. 
If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Okay, we're back with uh, Phil Francis of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks and Kristen Brengel from National Parks Conservation Association. Uh, before the break, Phil, you um, touched on the number of actings in the national park system, and it really does seem to um, be growing and growing in terms of the number of acting positions out there. As uh, I learned the other day, I guess the superintendent of uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park has been sent to the Pacific West region where she's in, in an acting role, I believe, as a deputy regional director. The communications director for, or the communications staffer from Hawaii Volcanoes has also moved to Pacific West region as acting communications to replace uh, um, an individual who went to the Washington headquarters in an acting role at the uh, National Park Service headquarters. And of course, we've got uh, acting regional directors at the Intermountain region and the um, Midwest region, although that's soon to be filled. But when that is filled, we'll have an, another acting regional director in the Alaskan region. It's kind of hard to keep track of this. And who knows how many acting superintendents are out there as well as other acting positions across the park system. What, what's going on with all this? Is this normal um, operating business, uh, Phil? Unfortunately, it's becoming that way. Uh, and I think it's a function primarily of a, a personnel office that doesn't work well. I think the stovepiping of human resources in a National Park Service, one of the worst ideas that the department has ever had. And uh, many of us who were working at the time anticipated that this would uh, be the result of this stovepiping. There were some very good people working on the project, but it's the structure that produces the bad results. I think there are many people who would love to do nothing more than to, to fill the jobs in the parks. Seasonal positions are left vacant for too long. Uh, some positions that would normally be filled in April or May are still open. So I think it's a structural issue. I know when the uh, when the uh, reorganization took place of HR, uh, a million additional dollars was given to the National Park Service personnel office to ensure that it succeeded. But the structure is is a real problem. So it's going to take a while to fix it, and I understand that there's going to be a uh, discussion on August 12th with the National Park superintendents to discuss the HR plans to make improvements. But I, but I do think that's the major part of the problem. The other could be uh, the fact that there are acting positions uh, up the line who may not be able to make the decision to fill or do, they don't want to make the decision to fill positions below them. Uh, you always want to have the permanent person making a decision. So, I mean, they have to live with their results. <laughs> Uh, the results of their decisions about who is in place. And so I think there's a variety of reasons, but I think the main one, again, is the HR organizational structure. Kristen, does the MPCA have any feel for how this is possibly affecting morale across the national park system that, you know, we don't have any, there's a lot of vacant positions and a lot of acting positions. I mean, does that trickle down into a morale issue? Everything about it is a morale issue from the superintendents that need people 
and they're they know they're not getting things done, whether it's a maintenance project or uh, getting seasonals on the ground to serve visitors. So we hear about it from superintendents who are worried about getting basic things done in the parks and fulfilling uh, maintenance projects. And then we're hearing about it from the seasonals who have to go through this incredible process in order to just apply for the jobs and, and get them and get to the park where they need to be. And and then they have these additional hurdles, these additional rules that were added about these six-month terms that have created, you know, problems for folks in terms of, of having to be at one park for six months and move to another park and then come back to the park. And it, it hasn't been easy for anyone. And what we're worried about is that it will discourage people from wanting to work for the park service. And we want great people in our parks, and we want to pay them good salaries and make sure they feel uh, welcome and and go through a, a seamless process. But it's, you know, from everything we've heard, it's been very discouraging uh, for folks at the highest levels and the and and the seasonal level and in between. Yeah, we've had a a number of comments on our our Facebook page, Travelers Facebook page, about how hard it is to to get. A job with the National Park Service and, and the and the crazy seasonal rules that they have. I think it affects the visitors in a lot of ways. Um, you know, and visitors come to parks and expect for campgrounds and programming to be occurring inside of national parks, and they discover that it's not, or maybe it's changed in terms of quality or volume. Uh, I think it has an impact on visitors who come unexpectedly to find uh, that there's a problem in the parks, and then. I know it disappoints, as Kristen mentioned, is everything about it is a morale issue. Is, is, uh, people want to do a good job. They want to, for the national parks to be the best in the country. And when they're unable to accomplish their work because of vacant positions, uh, it's very, very stressful um, for people who have high standards and want to do the very best job they can. Yeah. I think one one superintendent was telling me that after the shutdown, uh, when they were scrambling to move through the HR process to hire seasonals, they basically pulled people from everywhere they possibly could in order to fill out all the paperwork to to try to rapidly move their hiring process for seasonals so that they had people on the ground to start the spring season. And just to think about what it would take for a superintendent to do something like that and what's not getting done because everyone's just trying to work with this HR process. It's, think about that (laughs) and what that, what toll that takes. Um, So, and the, and the shutdown already took a toll on people. And then you're scrambling after the shutdown ends to hire the folks you need for this season before visitors really start coming in. Yeah, it's crazy. What what do you hear on the the reorganization front? Um, and the reason I ask that is, I, I know um, Democrats in the House of Representatives don't seem too keen on it, and and haven't been happy with the lack of response to questions they've posed to Interior Department regarding the cost and how it's all going to be done. And yet, um, Interior seems to be moving ahead with it. Um, the other day, when they announced that uh, Bert Frost, the Regional Director for Alaska, will be moving to the Midwest region of the National Park Service as Director later this year, um, they referred to it as in charge of Unified Division X, Y, and Z. Um, is this going to happen, reorganization? So we... We have heard, um, obviously, if folks are reading the papers, the priority for the administration, as it appears so far, is that they wanted to move the BLM headquarters to Grand Junction, Colorado. And then they have a plan to move other BLM folks to different states out west as well. So that that appears to largely be uh, the biggest priority at this point. And then these unified areas as well, but what hasn't been cleared up yet and that we are really waiting for is the guidance that will go to all of the agencies out in the field as to what the reporting structure is with these unified regions. We just don't know yet. They haven't provided any guidance on how decisions are going to be made and, and what this collaboration process is going to look like. So um, it's a mystery to everyone. But I can tell you after sitting with several members of Congress, including appropriators, uh, there is a, a 
a lot of frustration about uh, the BLM headquarters and and the reorg. And I think this this is not going to um, this is going to be a continuing issue up on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I fear once again, and as we were talking about the the personnel issues in the National Park Service, this new structure um, is loaded for problems. It allows for political people to supervise more directly the field, and uh, I'm concerned about that. Concerned that the institutional memory of the leaders throughout the National Park Service uh, may be of little value or gone, and instead the organizations will be led by people who are political appointees who may maybe not will not have the same degree of experience and and uh, commitment to the mission of the service. So I think that the structure is a real problem, and um, I'm, we're going to be watching very closely to see what happens. Yeah, I'm just wondering also about the, the long-term fallout of this, if it moves forward or it gets halfway there, and then a new administration comes in and says we're going to revert to the, the long-standing organization of the Interior Department and whether this is, will hamstring the agencies going forward, not just the Park Service, but the, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Indian Affairs, other bureaus within Interior. Yeah, it could be a complete mess. And it could, I mean, there's no telling until it's all implemented, Kurt, you know, where this is going to go and whether it needs to be unraveled by a new administration. You know, I'm always fascinated by this with this administration on whether they can actually follow through with anything. (laughs) You know, they, they, they do on certain issues and don't on others. And it's really hard to tell. There's no method to the madness. And because there's been this revolving door of political appointees and acting positions. You're never talking to the same person, you know, one month to the, you know, three months from now. And so it's, it's, it's hard to tell whether or not they can pull this off. And I wonder if Rob Wallace is a hundred percent behind it. I don't know. That's a good question. You should have him on the podcast. And ask yeah. <laughs> good idea. We've, we've been talking today with uh, Christian Brangle, the Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Parks Conservation Association, and Phil Francis, uh, Chair of the uh, Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. And I'm, I'm sure we could go on for, for longer, but uh, let's save some issues for later this summer. I appreciate your time today, folks, and uh, get out and enjoy the parks before the fall arrives. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Hope you do. Thanks, Kurt. It's been good to hear your voice. Same here. Good to hear you. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. I placed a mix of boneless breast meat, boneless thighs, and bone-in thighs in the bottom of the Dutch oven and the meat began to sizzle in the hot olive oil. Diced onions, potatoes, sliced celery, and dried morels from the nearby mountains soon followed. Before long, it was all simmering in a quart of vegetable broth, along with plenty of a hearty red wine. And then, we pretty much forgot about it for a couple hours, giving us time to nibble a few tasty lobster tails and down a few beers. By then, the coca van was perfect, the meat moist and succulent and swimming in a tasty broth. 
Dutch oven cooking can be just that easy. A bit of preparation time, then a bit of a wait. I can see how cooking with Dutch ovens could take some practice and repetition, though. I had first encountered Dutch oven cooking after a short day on a long river. We got into camp at midday. That turned out to be a blessing, as we were able to set up our tents and kitchen just before the skies opened up and released a drenching rain. Soon our group of 15 was relaxing in chairs rooming a campfire. An overhead tarp kept the downpour off our backs. Off to the side, a few of the women were busy combining a variety of ingredients. Flour, sugar, milk, butter, and more, which they poured into a Dutch oven whose bottom had been lined with succulent slices of pineapple. They brought this cast iron pot over to the fire, which had burned down to hot coals, and planted it square in the middle. A handful of the glowing embers went onto the pot's lid, and that was that. After the ladies decided enough time had elapsed, they served up some fresh and golden pineapple upside-down cake for dessert. What a fantastic meal on the river. Mealtime on your trips into the national parks, whether you pull into a site in the front country campground, head down a river, or paddle across a lake and end the day on a shore, is a high point. Dutch oven cooking gives you time to sit around with friends and family, laugh, talk, and literally nibble the hours away. With today's technology, you can be as elaborate as you want with your meals, or as quick and simple as you need to be, of course. Freeze-dried and dehydrated meals have improved immensely over the decades. You can go with the tasty gluten-free entrees, such as Thai curry and smoked three-bean chili from Good to Go, which are rehydrated with a cup or so of boiling water and soon ready to eat, or similar products. One company, GSI Outdoors, can help you outfit a backcountry kitchen that would please Gordon Ramsay. This small, privately held U.S. company has pots and pans, cooking systems, chef's tools, and much, much more for both front country and back country use. Their pressure cookers are particularly interesting if you frequently travel above 4,000 or 5,000 feet in elevation, as they greatly reduce cooking time. And their Halulite 5.7 liter pressure cooker can even travel into the backcountry if your mode of travel is a raft, kayak, or canoe. Weighing less than 5 pounds, this unit is easily stashed in your gearbox or kayak hatch. We tested the pressure cooker with some lobster tails and a cup of water. In less than 10 minutes, we were dipping steaming chunks of sweet lobster into melted garlic butter. It was divine. And that's just one example. The cooker can quickly cook a wide range of foods, from beef chuck roast, 35 minutes with one and a half cups of water, and leg of lamb, 35 or 40 minutes, again, with one and a half cups of water, to salmon fillets and black beans. The non-reactive, hard adenized aluminum construction makes it easy to clean the pressure cooker. But food smells can be harder to remove. The silicon sealing ring around the lid absorbed the smell of lobster and held onto it through several washings, leading us to seek a second seal that we could use. For those new to pressure cookers, the instruction booklet provided by GSI Outdoors covers everything you need to know, from defining just what a pressure cooker is, how it works, and even providing safety tips. It also has great cooking ideas, such as braising meat or poultry in the pot before adding the water and putting the lid on. Since the temperature of boiling water decreases with altitude, the included chart is invaluable. It spells out how much extra time you should allow for cooking at altitudes ranging from 2,950 feet above sea level, where you would need 5% more time, all the way up to 7,874 feet, where you would have to factor in 30% more cooking time. And then, of course, the booklet includes cooking times and the amount of water to be added for meats and poultry, seafood, vegetables, dried beans, and rice. Meanwhile, back at our campfire... While the cocoa van simmered in the Dutch oven, we cooked and ate our lobster. Every so often, we'd check on the main dish and drop another few coals on the lid. What's the appeal of a Dutch oven? They and their sibling skillets are made of heavy-duty cast iron that can stand up to years of use, get incredibly hot when necessary, and are great for searing meats. There are some good cookbooks on the market for Dutch oven cooks. I like Dutch Oven Cast Iron Cooking Over an Open Fire by Karsten Both as he goes over both seasoning your oven before use, cleaning it, a short history of this unique cookware, and provides more than 100 recipes. To help keep your mealtime a little bit neater, 
You can use aluminum liners in the Dutch oven. They keep the oven itself clean, and it makes it easy to lift the meal out and bring it to the table. Sturdy lift lifters are ingenious, yet simple tools that let you pull up the lid of the Dutch oven without dropping any ashes into the pot. The lid lifter also has a hook for lifting the entire Dutch oven out of the fire by its wire handle. A padded carrying case for storage would probably be a good idea for traveling. While many recipes call for the use of charcoal briquettes for the heat source, you can also use a wood fire, as we did. Perhaps the greatest difference is that the briquettes are easy to count and, if you have a temperature chart, easier to distribute around the oven for a set temperature. That said, if you're not cooking a batch of cowboy sourdough rolls where you want a nice golden crust, you don't always need to place coals on the lid. We used a wood fire to create a bed of hot embers for our oven. A few tablespoons of oil on the bottom kept the chicken from burning, and then we added the other ingredients. The lid was put in place, and we topped it with a small but reasonable number of embers from the fire. An occasional check on the progress ensured that our oven stayed level while the coals below it burned down. You might need to add more coals or firewood to keep the temperature up. As I mentioned, these cast iron kitchen tools can absorb the odors and tastes of the foods you cook in them. While some say that this simply adds to the rich flavor of each subsequent meal, you wouldn't be wrong to have two or three Dutch ovens and assign ones to sweets such as pineapple upside down cakes and such, and the others to hearty and savory dishes. Finally, these cast iron ovens and skillets shouldn't be cleaned with steel wool products like SOS as they can scrape off your layer of non-stick seasoning that builds up during the cooking process. Instead, use plastic scrubbies or something similar. The folks at Bon Appetit recommend rubbing your cast iron cookware down with kosher salt and a kitchen tile while it's still warm, then wiping it down with fat, such as flaxseed oil or lard. The salt acts as an abrasive without scraping off the seasoning coating. While these pressure cookers and cast iron ovens are not items you'd want to put in a backpack, they're great for the back of a truck, in a canoe, or on a horse packing trip. They're durable and pretty much foolproof. Bon Appetit! That's it for this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. You can stay on top of news from National Parks every day of the week by reading nationalparkstraveler.org. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.